Yay. And um, next up, we're going to have Joe Scantleberry, who is the president and CEO of Living Cities, in conversation with Mayor Melvin Carter. Uh, Mayor Carter has said before that he wants um, St. Paul to be the cooperative capital of the world. And so I'm really excited for all the work that's happening in the city and to hear from Joe and Mayor Carter. And with that, Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I apologize that I was not able to hear everything you all talked about this morning. My colleagues were here. Colleagues, raise your hand. <laughs> and so they've been asking you all a bunch of questions, just like last night, getting together with so many of you. I had a chance to ask a lot of questions as well. Um, I have to say, first of all, what is Living Cities? Let me just start there, because even my mother doesn't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Living Cities is a funder and member collaborative. What does that mean? means that some time ago, a group of folks who have a lot of money got together and said, how do we make a difference? And at that time, they thought they could solve poverty by just fixing the built community. If you fix the buildings, poverty solved. <laughs> Done. We're good. And they spent about 10 years and did some really cool things. They really power, put power investments into LISC and Enterprise Corp. And you guys know those organizations do great work. But somewhere along the lines, they discovered poverty wasn't solved. And so they tried lots of other things. How do we weigh in on policy? Community Reinvestment Act. Let's lean in on this. Let's, what can financial institutions do in a, better, in a better way? How do we deal with procurement policies that city governments could do? How do we help city governments think about inequities and help them look at their data? And how do we build shared prosperity plans across regions and cities? We tried all of that, really cool stuff. And then they asked the question, and truly the members were asking this question. Why does poverty persist to have a brown and black face? No matter where we do really cool stuff, and there are some of these foundations, you know, they couldn't talk about race. Some of them were really uncomfortable. You might be doing all the work in the world for people who are struggling financially, and they happen to be in a community that's all black, but we're not going to talk about blackness or race, because that's uncomfortable. So we're not going to do that. And I, yes, I'm a leader of color running a financial institution, but I don't want to lose my good job, so I don't talk about race. I don't talk about Latina community members or immigration or, you know, I could do it as a project. I don't talk about it. This board decided it was going to talk about it. So they got real deep on racial equity. Real deep. Hurt, hurt each other's feelings from time to time deep. But they stayed around the table together having this conversation. And so when I walk into this organization three years ago as a CEO, I'm walking in to a group of members who've su survived the pandemic, gone through internal struggles in their own organizations, looked at the internal struggles in living cities and said, OK, this is worthy of continued investment. This is worthy of continued effort. And so where we find ourselves today is we're an organization that believes in a couple of things. That in order to get after racial equity in America and to address inequity overall, we have to get after the question of inclusive capital. The people who were once capital need to be partners in the use of capital. The people whose land generated the capital had to be part of the conversation around capital. The people who emigrated here and who find themselves strangely not as privileged because of whiteness as they thought they should be, and who are now angry and upset, need to be in the conversation around inclusive capital. The people who we don't want to see because they built the railroads or are currently taking care of everybody's mama and children 
And in every kitchen in America, they are the lava platos and the cooks and the co cocineros, and they're doing every other job there that we don't want to see and recognize, and we want to build walls to prevent them from being here. All of those people, they should be part of the capital conversation too. Because you know what they do? They build businesses. They build whole economies. And so I come to St. Paul, and I have to say, my team knows this, I've been on the road for like months, it feels like, talking to people everywhere. <laughs> and even though we make some grants, we're not a fund, we're, we're, not, a, we're not a grant making organization. We make some grants. We, so I got to go out and hustle just like all of you do to get capital and resources <laughs> in. So I understand the chase. And I know Mark's going to write me a big check at some point, but that's OK, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. But all said, across the country, this conversation is happening. In this town, a different conversation is happening. I don't know if you guys know that. This conversation around collaboration and coming together is not the conversation I hear in Birmingham. It's not the conversation in Little Rock, I'll tell you that. It's not the conversation in Jackson, Baltimore, New York. I'm not saying there aren't people who are thinking about these things and who are attempting these things, but there isn't a whole community of folks trying to figure it out. I hate going into a city and saying you are unique, so I'm going to say y'all are special <laughs> in a good way. And there's very few places where you have public leaders who are standing shoulder to shoulder with you in the effort. In fact, I can't think of any place where this is the conversation. Can't. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and we got indictments going on in New York City. <laughs> Everybody resigning, right? That's not St. Paul. This is not even the conversation across the river with respect. So my hope is to interview your mayor, our mayor, and to have a conversation that uh, helps me walk away and share all that you are doing in a way that inspires others to join in with you because you are the movement for the inclusive capital that we need. With that, Mayor Carter, your floor. I and I don't even know how I'm introducing you to your own house. Come I on in. Well, I appreciate it. I'll take it. You set me up, though, because now all I can do is disappoint. <laughs> So, Mayor Carter, I am really curious. Here's a city. Here's a city. Here's the initiatives that are happening here around um, collaboration, inclusion, shared ownership. How's this happening here? From your perspective, what makes this fertile ground for this kind of work? You know, I, I appreciate the question. I think all ground is fertile ground for this kind of work. Ah. Um, you started off talking about stuff mm -hmm. and our obsession with like stuff at stuff. the expense of people. Mm -hmm. And you know, people in this room know the know the name Rondo, mm -hmm. right? I'm from a neighborhood called Rondo. Yes. And I tell folks all the time, I don't know what city you from, but you have the Rondo neighborhood. It just different has a different name. Correct. But Rondo is the once thriving, vibrant, historic African American community here in St. Paul that was uprooted to build the freeway. And all that means is that somebody in all of our seats, somebody at the city, somebody at the federal government, somebody at a nonprofit organization, somebody at a foundation, all looked at a strip of 700 people's homes, 700 families' homes, and said, hey, we could have a strip of concrete there. Said, you know what, you know what progress would be? Is if these homeowners and these business owners and these real estate owners uh, all of these children here, if, if, if we bulldozed all these families' homes 
and put a slab of concrete down, that would be progress. Right. And so it's, 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 it's not just to me that the, our, our, our addiction to stuff um, has slowed our progress to helping people. It's that our addiction to stuff has literally buried people. Um, to the extent that the reason I decided I wanted to run for city council in the first place 15 years ago was because we were building light rail on University Avenue. And I kid, like, look at the history if you weren't there. Like, we have this kind of fight about these three missing stations that should have been on the line, right? People would always say, you know, look, um, people, our, our, our studies show that people are going to be willing to walk a half a mile to a quarter of a mile to get to one of the stations. And I always asked, and nobody ever answered, are these August miles? <laughs> <laughs> that may, you didn't say Paul, that makes I'm a difference. Just, are these January miles? Like, what are we talking about? Because the math is different. You got a, you know, your calculator. Um, you look at the whole stretch of that line, and the station spacing was all oh, half a mile to a quarter mile apart. You get to the boundaries of the area I used to represent, literally the boundaries of the area I used to represent the city council, and the boundaries skipped to a mile. And then to help fund the thing, we said, well, we gotta you know, reduce the bus service here. So the neighborhood that I grew up in, the intersection closest to that, where the train is that I grew up on, by the like, Met Council's own numbers, would have had less access to transit service as a result of this billion dollar transit investment that we were putting in. Right. Like n less net access between not having a train stop there and having the bus come less. But all of the cost, mm -hmm of construction, all of the business interruption, all of the inconvenience, all of it. And so, so, so this like fixation, I, I'm, I'm stuck on this fixation with stuff that you were going, talking keep about. Going, keep going. Because it's, it's super, super real uh -huh. and it continues to act today. So when I ran for mayor the first time, you know, we spent two years just like in living rooms and coffee shops just asking people like, like tell me about, like what are you thinking? What's your vision? What are you feeling? And I think the two biggest themes that we heard the two biggest things that I heard is, one, I heard people all over the city say, like, you know, we have more to offer. You know, we're not being asked to, like, we're being asked sometimes what we think, but we're not being asked to help to Hold pitch on. in and put all our right. hands on something. I just heard that. Go ahead. Okay, good, mm -hmm. good. And the second piece was, like, we're used to cities sort of um, investing to create the, like, general dynamics in which success is, like, theoretically possible for people who understand the navigation map, right? Um, but we're not really used to cities like helping people. And that's a different thing, right? If you, if you just need help feeding your family, you go to the county, right? If you need help with homework, you go to the school board, right? We're, we're used to, like, if you need help with like rezoning a parcel of land so that you can do development, that's, that's when you go to the city, right? right, right. But we're not, we, we didn't really have a body of work just saying we're gonna, we're gonna help people. And so those are the two things that, that, that and, and they end up working together because we always talk about, and you know, it's good, it's good to be in this space, so project equity, um, equity is a word we use a lot. In my bio, it says that I'm a, 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 some champion for equity or something like that. And um, the first thing we have to understand is what the word equity means. And it's astounding, we were talking about this yesterday uh -huh. at City House, only when we start that conversation about black and brown people. Right. Like I went to business school. The only time equity doesn't mean money is when we're talking about brown and black people. Like, fight me. Some, I'll give you the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> like, when we're talking about brown and black people, we're talking about like, how we feel when we do it, right? Right, right, right. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, right. that's the only time, like, equity literally means right. shared economics. That's correct. But when, it, when we started connecting it, with like racial justice and racial fairness, and I recognize what you said really early on, we are always bringing race implicit solutions to solve race explicit problems. Even when we don't talk about it. Always. Mm -hmm. You know what? These kids in this, you know, we notice that black and brown kids um, are uh, less likely this and more likely this, and so we're gonna uh, target this resource to low income kids. Wait, that's not what you said. We know that black and brown women are more likely to experience X, Y, and Z in childbirth, so we're going to target this solution to these uh, 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 zip codes. That's, that's not what you said. Right. <laughs> that's, like, the answer is in the question. That's, that's not even what you said. 
And so when we launched the St. Paul Promise neighborhood when I was on the city council, there were people that sounds like you're just talking about focusing on you know, black children. And I would say, listen, I want to focus on the data. And let me tell you, when the data says that we can move our focus away from young black boys, from black and brown, young girls, when the data says we can move our focus somewhere else, I'll make the motion. Right. So all I have to say is, I, th I think what ends up happening is a lot of stuff we do, people look at me and go, oh, that's, that's so brave. And that's a crazy thing to hear sometimes. Uh -huh. Oh, it's better than, you're so articulate. That is, that is. <laughs> that is. <laughs> But inside, like, his, inside, but obvious his, joke. His, his, his wife is my, uh, is my big sister, right? Uh, and com community big sister. I just texted her. I texted her a picture of you in, doing my interest. And I said, he talked good. <laughs> 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 and she, she I'll show you. She responded, he's so articulate. <laughs> yes, he is. Yes, he is. So you're right on time with that. Here's the answer. I become convinced that every decision in the history of humankind has been made to benefit who? The decision maker. And every decision that will be made is gonna, like, I, I try to be as altruistic as possible, but I rarely make decisions that I think are just gonna like screw me over, <laughs> right? And so at some level, if we want City Hall, if we want the resources, the policies, the decisions we make in City Hall to benefit a wider set of people, the only real option, like on a sustainable systemic level, is to build a wider set of decision makers. Right. If, we, if we want our policies to, to benefit young people, the young people have to be at the table. If we want our policies to benefit communities of color, communities of color have to be at the seniors, whatever, whoever it is, if they're not at the table, we will not, we, I promise you, you cannot build a system. You cannot build inclusive, uh, uh, you cannot get uh, inclusive outcomes with exclusive systems. And so what ends up happening is we get a chance to sort of detach St. Paul from the traditional risk calculus that says doing something like taking a million dollars in American Rescue Plan funding and using it to purchase and eliminate $100 million in medical debt that our residents owe. Uh -huh. Inside City Hall, that feels risky, right? Like politically risky or like a lightning rod or something, right? Everywhere else, it feels like a great investment. It feels like the absolute best. Like, I tell people all the time, like, if this is a family, right? If I was going to say, uh, we're going to take uh, the Scandalberry family and uh, just all, get them all together, and we're going to take uh, $100 million that the Scandalberry family owes in debt. Uh -huh. Not me. <laughs> and if we can come up with a million dollars, we'll make the Scandalberry family $100 million better off. I guarantee. Our first question is, Cosign. is this real? Right. Our second question is, is this legal? <laughs> and I just want to know, like, you know, like, that doesn't necessarily end the conversation, but I just want to be clear. You know what I'm saying? And the third question is, how can we make sure, how can we do everything we can possibly do to make that happen? That's right. And so this is where, you know, our, our mantra is, like, what would happen if we look at a city and just say, this city is built not on a love of the stuff, but on a pure love of the people, uh -huh. and driven by this sense that like the, the, the uh, unsheltered neighbors that we have, uh, the children in every school and every neighborhood, the families that we talk about in campaign speeches all the time, uh -huh. like pretend we love them the same way we love the people we kiss every morning when we walk out the door, Amen. what will we do? So let me just say, first of all, I love that opening. That was long. That was, no, it was, it was long, but not a pin. I could not hear. A, I could hear. You could hear a pin drop. They may have heard all this before. In many different ways, but it's always good to hear it again. So philanthropy, love of humanity, that's what you just described. Yeah. How has philanthropy been helpful? And how has it been less than helpful? Uh, and 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 present company accepted, Mark. I'll tell you, McKnight has been just fantastic every step along the way. Uh, and they really have. They've been a great partner. Um, I, I, I'll go the opposite direction. And you know Tanya's a mad truth teller. So oh, it, here's the thing. We wouldn't be able to be where we are without philanthropy, right? Mm -hmm. The truth is, we have so, I mean, when people look at like, oh, yeah, you're on a, a billion dollar budget every year. It's like, yeah, but all of that money is like bought and sold before we ever see it, right? 
and there's so little that we have that we can be flexible and like innovative and entrepreneurial with and like come up with like a new idea to do something, you know. Um, and people always look, oh, you're wasting money on this or you're doing, and the truth is most of the things that like people tweet, you know, you shouldn't have spent money, is, is, it's a grant money from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, and you know, that's because we just don't have the ability a lot of times, right? And so one of the things that we've been really proud of is our ability to use, you know, we call, we call um, cities a laboratory of democracy. You ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. The problem is we are a laboratory without our R&D budget. <laughs> right? That's right. That's right. And most, so most cities have no flexibility none. to try anything. That's exactly right. Because mm -hmm. we're always, like, behind the eight ball, and inflation always kicks our butt. Like, this, like every year, this year the number was $19.4 million, right? From this year to next year, I could increase our, sale, our, our, our city's budget by $19.4 million. That'd be a double-digit property tax increase just to pay for all the same stuff we paid for last year, right? Not without anything new. So even just not even just this year's budget being tight, we're always, like, trying to figure out what we're going to, you know, which, which arms we're going to cut off for next year's right, budget. Right. And so we have no R&D budget. I'll say this. I think philanthropy has uh, come a long way, like, in the time that I've been working in this space. I remember when we were starting the Promise Neighborhood, and everybody was, you know, the buzzword was always, uh, um, what's the word, um, evidence-based best practices. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was a fun fact. And my question was always, like, how do you solve a problem that no one's ever solved before? Using only evidence-based best practices, which are, by definition, things we've already tried over and over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Right, but that was our fat. That was our, you know, it, everything had to fit in the uh, kind of evidence-based best practices bucket. I think I've seen areas where it felt like philanthropy was um, giving uh, for. Um, um, I criticize politics that are about, you know, there, there, there's politics and there's policy. Uh -huh. and there's a real subtle but important difference, right? Um, public safety politics are the problem in America, right? Public safety politics are about how people perceive the public safety work that we're doing. Public safety policy is about fewer kids getting shot, right? Public safety politics would make me try to make you feel comfortable despite the fact that kids are still getting shot. Public safety policy makes me go all in to try to get fewer kids shot and then try to help you understand what we're doing kind of as a, as a, as a you follow me? As a backup to that. And so I say all this to say, I think, We've had um, philanthropy historically that has operated in the politics world, uh -huh. right? Uh, who are the folks in the black community? That we can't lobby. What is that? That, that we can't that lobby. We can't lobby. That there's no accountability on right? right? Uh -huh. um, who are the folks who are the most visible? Who are the folks who are most likely to get quoted in the paper? Who are the organizations that we don't want to be on the bad side of? Um, and one of the things that, I've, that, I, that I internalized really quickly, one of my mentors was like, listen, like if, like that's, 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 that's just a different form of like poverty pimping. Right. Yeah. And so this, it's one of the reasons. And, you know, our Office of Financial Empowerment um, uh, is 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 a real pioneer in terms of evidence and independent evaluation. Uh -huh. And, you know, the whole body of work that Director Caliso leads, um, she can tell you. I tell folks all the time, like when it comes to like the, our, the sacred work that we do, if an article doesn't include the word standard deviation, I don't need it. Like, <laughs> don't send it to me. <laughs> right. But she can tell you. What the independent, third-party, professional evaluators say, like, this is what the result that we're achieving because of this work that we're doing. Because it's crazy how little we talk about outcomes in politics. We always talk about the process. We always talk about what we're going to try. We always talk about our new proposals and ideas. It's crazy how many billions of dollars we spend without ever dis So all I have to say is I think philanthropy is helping these days to fund, um, to, to help us do the type of um, experimental work, right. um, which you can't do experimental work without the like space to fail, right. uh, and, and to fail forward, That's right? right. Um, politicians always have to prove that they're like King Midas, everything I touched, uh, turned into gold, look at them, perfect again, it's amazing, right? Um, but that's not the real world, you can't, right. like. You're risking nothing if you don't fail, it, this, now it, and then. That's right, if you're batting a thousand, you're not swinging enough, that's right? right? And so, you know, we, I, think, I think a lot of our, our foundation partners have, 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 have done a much better job helping us to be able to do that, uh, to stick in with us, with, you know, for, for results and not just the sort of uh, politics. Um, and um, I think to put us in the driver's seat, right? We've had different uh, grants that we've done with different foundations. And 
sometimes you go down a road and you find out the road is different than you thought it was. Mm -hmm. and yeah, with the, with, the, with the grant maker. With the grant maker, right. Like, um, and we might have, I mean, uh, one example is uh, in our public, I keep talking about public safety, but in our public safety work, uh, we started this notion of alternative responses to 911 call. Uh -huh. And as we got halfway in, we realized we were really talking about optimal responses to 911 calls, right? Which doesn't always mean alternative, like the police doesn't come. Sometimes it means we're coming together. Sometimes it means we're doing a tag off. Sometimes right. it means, you know what I mean? Um, and, you know, we ended up having a conversation with the funder. who was like, well, that, that's not what, you know, your proposal said to us at the beginning. Uh, and we talked through it and we walked through it. And they said, okay, got it. That makes sense. Right. Like, keep, right. keep doing that. So, I mean, I think that type of uh, leeway is, is important. So you just described a powerful relationship between yourself as a city leader and philanthropy and the funders who have trusted you and you trust to have a real dynamic conversation. I wasn't here this morning, but I was here last night and I was asking a lot of questions around sustaining the work, how it gets sustained, the challenges around the work, access to capital, right? And I know, Mark, where are you? Right, I know there's some voices who might say, well, we don't need that kind of capital, but financial institutions have a responsibility to cities, et cetera, so they, they hold your notes, okay? <clears throat> I'm curious what you would say to this room of folks who are trying different things to build employee ownership in business, figuring out different ways of thinking about shared capital and round real estate and how to claim land and build that land for the use of people, for the love of people, and doing it together. And the together part will come to. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to sustain, and people are people. But I'm curious about the relationship with financial institutions. And specifically, since I sit on a board, well, I don't sit on the board anymore. I, well, I guess I am on the board. But I have a board. Just decide. I have, <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with it either way. I have a board. I, I'm, I'm going through double consciousness okay, right now. Okay. Um, we have a board of financial institutions and foundations. And you know, they kind of tasked me to go out in the world and learn how they can be even better at what they do. What would you tell financial institutions who are looking at a community like this and wondering what's their entry point, what's their responsibility to this group of folks who are innovating, right? We say we want innovation. They're innovating, they're testing, they're trying, they put sweat equity, brain equity, intellectual capital, they're doing it all. What's the role of financial institutions to either grow this, sustain this, or to create new ways of um, growing it? Yeah, it's an intriguing question. You know, our financial institutions have historically been uh, the, the gatekeepers of all of this. Uh -huh. They're the gatekeepers of wealth, right? Uh -huh. They get to decide who gets in and who gets out. Who's risky, who's not. Who's risky, who's not, right? I mean, the, 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 the crazy thing, when we talk about, like, um, uh, tenants, being able to pool their money and buy the building they live in. Uh -huh. People go, oh wow, that's, that's, a, that's incredible. And I say, it's not. It's really not incredible. Like, like, their rent pays every single bill for this building already. That's right. right. This is not incredible. Like, this is not an incredible idea. It's math, like, actually. These 10 families <laughs> right. already pay every single penny. Right. They, like, like, there's not somebody out there like just you know let's chip in for these families and you know, <laughs> like these families already pay every cent that needs to be paid to facilitate this building, right. and some and a financial institution gets to decide whether the person who doesn't live there who might live across town or like you know what I mean somewhere else, um, or those people who are like actually the lifeblood of that building who are actually paying for it. I mean, same is true when we talk about worker-owned cooperatives, right? Like, the frontline workers are who are doing, the, I, I tell folks all the time, like, my job is to heroically sign papers and give speeches <laughs> while other people do all of the real work, right? Like, the frontline work, they're the ones who are making the money go, right? right? And then you learn the phrase, like, leverage buyout, right? I'm buying this company, I'm financing it, off the future returns of what they're going to do, of the work that the frontline black and brown workers are doing in the first place. I'm not finding it's in off of the money I have in my bank account already, but somebody decides who gets to come through those gates and who doesn't, right? And we get so stuck. That, listen, the most important question anybody ever asked me, this is a weird story, but stick with me, I promise. Um, when I first got elected mayor, uh -huh. somebody said, hey, are you going to um, move the furniture in the mayor's office? And like, the question like blew my mind. When I tell you, I was like, whoa, right? 
because I've been around City Hall for so long, and I, like people come and people go, but the desk is still in the same spot. And it was like printed on my brain, and I kid you not, I got elected mayor not knowing that it was within my power to move the desk from one side of the room to the other. And that's a silly anecdote, but like, think about the ways in which we become married to, we become the enforcers of the status, like accidental enforcers of the status quo that just because it's what we inherited. You know what I'm talking about? Like we become the ones who, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so like that's been something to me, but, but then, so, so, so something that's been on my mind a lot lately is I ask people to help me define different words, right? We need a functional definition of the word equity. It's gotta be about money. When my business school dean said uh, equity, she was talking about money, she was talking about um, appreciating assets, uh, she was talking about being able to, tran and transferable assets that I can pass on to my child if I want to. She was talking about decision making power, which is why we do all this stuff we do through, you know, look at Twitter, it's full of people laughing at the, the task forces and the commissions that we build for this or that or the other. Um, and she was talking about a shared economy. Because if I own equity in a company, and the company has a good quarter, I have a good quarter too. That's right. Um, we need a definition of the word precedent, because particularly as public leaders, uh, banks, financial institutions, our courts, like we operate like we operate on precedent in so many aspects of our country. Somebody give me a quick definition of the word precedent. Happened before. The way things are usually done, right? Yeah. The way things are always done. Somebody give me a quick definition of the word insanity. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, right? But that's what precedent is. So people look at that, why are you doing that different? Because we, we need a definition of poverty. We don't know what poverty. Yeah. So St. Paul, we're, I'm one of the national co-chairs of this organization called Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. We're the first American city to use public funding to launch a guaranteed income pilot. It was an accident. I didn't know that until like two years later. They're like, you're the first. I was like, we were? Uh, we were just trying to do the work. Um, again, I don't know where you grew up, but there was some uncle. There was somebody who told if you give poor people money, they'll just. Oh, hell yeah. They're just what? Go waste it. Yeah, they'll go, it's been on drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since the onset of the pandemic, 60 plus pilots across the country, mm -hmm. we've distributed over $250 million in unconditional cash to low income families across this country. Does not matter the city, 90% of the money goes to basic necessities. Absolutely. Less than 1% of the money goes to vices. Mm -hmm. I would argue that PPP was higher than 1%. <laughs> And check this out, families, you know, it's, it's not a surprise that families who have some money, so $500 a month for a period of two years, right, uh, we just launched, we just finished this pilot we were doing. It's not surprising that families have a little bit more money at the end of the month, are a little bit happier, have a little less stress, mm -hmm. they can uh, absorb a, a, a financial emergency a little bit better. What surprises some people is, again, I've got a handful of like double blind, you know, randomized control studies um, that will show you that when low income people have money, they don't use it as an excuse to work less, they use it as an opportunity to work more. That's correct. And what occurs to me is, we've built a war on poverty. You know, and I, and I always joke, I'm like, we're 60 years in a war on poverty, and we just ought to give them poor people money. <laughs> <laughs> we just can't like, oh, I have an idea. Right. Um, <laughs> but here's why. We've built a whole war on poverty on stupid lies. Somewhere along the way, me and you, mm -hmm. and we had to unlearn it. Yes, we did. And if you were in this room, you probably unlearned this. But somewhere along the way, we believed somebody when they told us that, like, hardworking people who never see a penny in their life without punching a pay, pay clock are lazy. And people who live off of, like, dividends, they're the industrious ones. That's right. That's right. Don't, like, you believed it too. Don't act like I'm the only one in the room. Like, <laughs> we let somebody say, did you see that single mom over there? She's working minimum wage, paying the rent, and feeding four children. Putting them through school. She don't know how to manage her money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Like, these, they're not even good lies. <laughs> right? But, but, but what they really were telling us is that when people are living in poverty, it's because they lack character. And we bought it, and we built generations of public policy on the basis of that belief, which is why it's all failing. Uh -huh. What we learned is 
when people live in poverty, it means they don't have money, mm -hmm. and it means they don't have tools to make that money work for them. They don't have the vehicles. Right. And it suddenly turns from some, it turns poverty to me from some God-inspired phenomenon to just a machine that we built in City Hall that we can rewire in City Hall too. I'm just ranting. I don't even know what the no, question no, no, you asked no. me. <laughs> but, but you're ranting well, though. You're what was the question well. you asked me? Did you I even get close well. to it? No, no, no. I'm, I'm actually going to go a little different here because in this room and in your city, you've had people of all different persuasions who've decided to come together. Yeah. I'm not saying that that's always peaceful. I'm not saying that's not always... It shouldn't the, be peaceful. Hang on, hang on. Stay with me. There should be physical. There, 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 <laughs> Right. That there aren't disagreements and different points of view, generational views, lots of different dynamics. But somehow they've decided to work together for mutual benefit. And at this time, the narrative, because as you were laying out the narrative about, you know, the single mom, because the narrative is she failed, yeah. right? Um, but many of us who have had those moms, yep. my sister's a judge. That's right. I'm doing what I do. My mother still don't know what I do, but she knows so that one she, out of two ain't But bad. she knew she got me out the house, <laughs> right? and I didn't come back. That's right, right? That's right. And now I can take care of her. That's right. My point, though, is the narratives yeah. are that we can't do what these people are doing. The narratives are that we're at each other's throats. The narratives are that someone's going to lose if we ad abandon zero sum economics and policy. So, right. oh, you set me up. Good, good, yeah. That's right. So that's what you the narrative. So you know, speak, narrative? speaking of what we should say to financial institutions to get them engaged in and this beyond, <laughs> and beyond. What is the narrative? Because you've got some evidence of something different. No, you're right. I mean, and and, and that is this. And uh, brother Rapa, we were at a dinner. What was that 2016, 2017? And brother Rapa was talking about shared ownership models. And it was like the clouds opened up to me. And I, was, I sat down like, I don't know, what are you talking about, you know? And it was like the clouds opened up to me. Not only do I think this is a way, uh -huh. I think this is the way. Uh -huh. You know, as we think about the impact that the boomers have had on our, I mean, the, the, the question at some point is going to be, who are the next investors? Who are the next business owners? Right. Who's the next generation of homeowners? That's Who's right. the next generation of developers? Who's the next generation? And we're very clear, Living Cities, ownership is a pathway to wealth building. Without got, a doubt. You gotta own. You Without gotta a doubt. Part of owning. Continue. Without a doubt. H hands down, mm -hmm. ownership is still the number one like route to wealth creation in Correct. America. Correct. Right? And um, so at some level, and we spend a lot of time talking to banks about this, our Office of Financial Empowerment, our goal is to get you more customers. We got a whole, we got a whole neighborhoods full of people who don't know that their money would be better off in your accounts. That's true. Like, you, we got, it, racism is, is, is crazy. Like, it, I think about like um, Colin Kaepernick. You don't know who Colin Kaepernick is? You got people who are like, I'm invested billions of dollars in this football team. And I'd rather a less talented quarterback throw the ball than put it in the hands of Colin Kaepernick. Right? Racism is so self defeating. Like, I feel bad for racists, you know? I, I don't want to say that, but. <laughs> but I, I, I saw it though. I saw but it, right, I saw the bubble. It's so self-defeating. It, it it blocks you from seeing. Like I said, there was a there was a point in time where we we're too racist to let black people on our basketball teams. You know what I'm saying? And I think that there's a there's a there's a there's a version of what we see from fi historically from financial institutions. That are that exact same that exact same phenomenon. That are just as ridiculous uh -huh. as being like, uh, nope, LeBron James is black. He can't come play with us because there's so much innovation out there. And again, that's what our goal is in St. Paul. That's why I say I think every place is fertile place for this type but of I work. But I want to scale up this tension. because there's. But let me finish Go because ahead. there's there's underinvested, underrealized potential right. that exists in so many neighborhoods across St. Paul. That exists in so many places across the country, and therein lies. Our, 
I think, most potent opportunities for economic growth that this country has to offer. I hear the hope, but I want to go to the challenge. Okay. The challenge is I'm prepared to see that community lay fallow, nothing growing, yeah. minimal growth, yeah. rather than shift my point of view on who I invest in. 1.56 trillion, yeah. well, excuse me, 1.56 percent, 1 1.6, let me round it up, percent of private capital, global, 1.6 percent of $68 trillion in private capital are in the hands of all black people, all people of color, all women being managed by that, that percentage. Percent. Country that by 2045 is gonna look like this room and only handful of white men figuring out what are the innovations that should be invested in. Percent. So we ain't gonna grow. And we're comfortable with that. We're comfortable with that status quo. Yeah. Now, what St. Paul is doing is challenging that status quo in a very public, hands on the ground, ten, as the young people say, 10 toes down, ten doing toes, it. 10 toes down. That's you right. got it. So my question is, how does that get lifted? What is the evidence that we need to actually not just propound what's successful, but frankly, the shift in value. Because you started with the shift in value. You started with the story of paving paradise and putting in a parking lot. That's right. Okay? That's right. I heard the song as you were saying. That's right. That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. And now you're doing different. <laughs> Let me say it this way. You know a picture, you know, you know that picture, the equity picture? Yeah. Of the kids watching the baseball game? Uh-huh. I hate that picture. <laughs> I'm serious. I absolutely hate that picture. I think that picture takes us the wrong way. Uh -huh. And you guys know the picture I'm talking about? Yeah. It's a picture of kids watching a baseball game, and there's a fence, and they have to see over the fence. And you know, some kids have the different blocks, and one kid has, is the taller kid, so he needs fewer blocks. And one kid's the you know, medium, and one kid's the short kid, so he needs all the blocks. You know what I mean? And I think we've made the mistake of telling people with power, influence, and access to capital that the answer for our communities is uh, your kid having fewer blocks. And listen, I'm, I, try to be, like, I try to be as altruistic as possible and lead with the sense of like, feel harmonic love. Mm -hmm. If the answer for the world is Melena and Naomi and Amila and Ari, if, if, is, we have a lot of kids. If the answer for the world is my kids having less, mm -hmm. I'm out. Mm -hmm. That's not racist. I think that's logic, common sense, right? And that's why I hate that picture, because it creates a zero-sum notion of what we're trying to do. Meaning, if you have today, you need to lose in order to... You have to lose in order for somebody... Like, I don't think that's the truth. I think if St. Paul figures out that these folks who come into this city from another country are opening up new frontiers of economics that aren't accessible to just the Vikings, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, the people who come into St. Paul who speak different languages open up like channels of business that we can't have access to otherwise, right? That's not taking blocks from somewhere. That's like manufacturing new blocks, right? right? And, and that's the approach that we need to take. I, I'll give you an example. And so, so, so I think it's about not trying to get people to do a, 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 a charity. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've learned about my work is if we can get our city to the place where we do something because it's the right thing to do, it might last as long as I am in the room, mm -hmm. right? We got to figure out how these are solid investments that generate a return. So my first year as, uh, on the city council, when I was working on the St. Paul Promise neighborhood, there's a group of folks, and I'd, I'd say probably most young black and brown elected officials have this dynamic, right? Where the side of town you go to to um, uh, get your sense of purpose may not necessarily be the side of town you go to get your uh, votes and campaign contributions. And uh, there was a group of folks who brought me into a room and said, hey, listen, we see you spending a lot of time in Frogtown and some of you, if you know St. Paul, we see you spending all your time over there. And, you know, that work is cool, but, like, what do we get out of this? And, again, that's not, I don't, that's not racist. No, no. And, <laughs> right? and you're their mayor. I'm their, I was their city council member at the right. time, right? That's not racist. 
And I ended up saying, well, tell me this. What's your biggest challenge? What's your biggest frustration? Their biggest frustration was their property taxes kept going up. And they're like, well, you know what? My, 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 my property value stayed still, but my property tax went up. I said, oh, well, that's because property values somewhere else are going down. So <laughs> if that's your biggest problem, then what we need is a strategy that will help stabilize property value somewhere else. By the way, this is an education initiative, and the number one thing that impacts property values is, well, number one and two is always public safety and school quality. School, school quality. Exactly. And they went, oh, get back over there. So I think that's the way we have to approach it. I don't think we can expect financial institutions to do it because it's in the best interest of you know my children or because you know we're you know whatever. I don't think we can. I don't think we should expect them to go beyond kind of the basic kind of CRA type of kind of requirements. I think as we uh, deliver a, a vision for uh, the, the the shareholder returns that they can have act that they can plug into that they don't otherwise. Uh, the championships you can win once you figure out to let LeBron James on your team. You know what I mean? Like once we figure out the like financial, like that, that value proposition there, that's where that, I, I think, and I think it's on us to be able to demonstrate that financial proposition, which is where we need those laboratories of democracy. Like I'm going to throw an audible here. Uh, the, the organizing team did not give me authorization to do this, but I do want to open up for questions because I see lots of questions and I see faces who are like locked in. Um, so I want to make sure we do that because one of our missions is to share the wealth and to share the ideas around the work and to give credit to where the creativity is happening, right? We're a national intermediary. We learn from so many people everywhere and we're trying to figure out how do we distill and share that so that others can pick up like, I want you to get a call from Birmingham and Jackson, you know, saying, how are you doing this? And how can I do this in a context where I am? So ready for questions? Please. Hi, everyone. My name is Tammy, and I'm with Urban Homeworks. Um, I loved what you were talking about, um, Mayor Carter. And I guess I'm curious to know, like earlier when you talked about um, needing to make a bigger room of decision makers, like how you as mayor and how city council is being intentional to one, remove barriers and make space for community members, that single mom, the hard workers that we're talking about that work nine to five, you know, they can't speak or they can't come to a city council meeting and testify at two in the afternoon when they're at work. They can't come to this round table because they're at work. How are you making space to be intentional to bring those decision makers to the table? I love that question and I really appreciate it. So one is everything we do, we do through public engagement, right? So every member of my cabinet, every single member of my cabinet I've ever appointed has been appointed through what we call a community-based hiring process, right? Where we have literally hundreds of people who get together and help kind of think through people who might make a good library director. Uh, they you know, recruit candidates, they sort through the resumes, they decide who they want to interview, they do the first round of interviews and send me a couple of finalists. Uh, who they think would be p good people, right? The first time we did it, like the newspaper was like, wow, this is the like most diverse cabinet we've ever seen in the history of the city. How did you do that, right? And what I end up telling the press is like, in a diverse city like St. Paul, you don't have to like, how did you get a diverse cabinet? You have to, how did you get a white cabinet? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean it's true. <laughs> you know, like, you have to like, I mean, just basic probability and statistics, right? Like, you have to like, do something special to get an all-white cabinet, not to get the type of diverse cabinet that we landed on. Uh, so whether it's minimum wage or whatever it is, like I said, we're always kind of launching task forces. We have a, a set of like task forces and commissions uh, that help us kind of bring the uh, recommendations to the city council and to the mayor to, to make decisions on. Um, we um, uh, launched a policy to put at least two young people on every single one of those task forces and commissions, um, and we pay them to be on there. Um, and it's too, because I was that kid when I was a kid, it'd be like, put Melvin on the board, right? And I'd be sitting at this board table like, a lawyer, what do you think? Mayor, what do you think? Doctor, what do you think? Right? Uh, so and so, like, representative, what do you think? Melvin, what do high school students student think? And I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so we were trying to build a critical mass to make sure they're not, we're not just kicking them all day, so we say we did it, right? Um, and so we do a lot of, we do a lot of public engagement with the, the city, the, um, every budget that I bring to the city council, we do what we call our uh, city budget engagement games, right? Which we go to community. So like I'm sitting in Johnson High School, right? I'm sitting in Central High School uh, in the lunchroom or in the cafeteria, you know, in, in a math class, just talking to people like this, how the city budget works. Tell me like how you, how you think this through. Uh, or uh, seniors, senior homes or like the 
boards of directors or neighborhood groups. Um, some of them are 10 a.m. on a Monday. Some of them are 6 p.m. on a Thursday. Some are on a Saturday. You know, so trying to vary stuff around so that it, we, we're able to accommodate. And some of them are virtual, so we can accommodate the way different people's lives work. Uh, but none of that actually gets to the heart of the question that you just asked. Um, the best uh, uh, example of good governance I've ever seen is that you guys know Central High School? There's a spot on the side of the grass at Central High School, my high school, class of 97. Woo woo. Um, there's a spot on the side of the grass where for like 30 years there's been a, 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 a shortcut, a little trail worn in the grass. And, you know, it always strucks me that if we were to, say, you know, put an announcement, there's 2,000 students at Central, you know, uh, listen, at uh, 5.30 next Wednesday there will be a public hearing at City Hall on optimal sidewalk alignment. Uh, the optimal sidewalk alignment public hearing is 5.30 next Wednesday at City Hall, right? Um, you know how those students would respond, right? But every morning, for like 20 years, 2,000 students know and show that it makes more sense to walk across the grass right here than to go up around kind of these, you know, geometric shapes that we create, right? Um, and what I was going to say is a good example of, 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 of good government is eventually the school district paved a sidewalk right where that shortcut was. And so we got to know that people are literally always telling us what they think. People are always talking with their feet. Like, like every moment of every day, our residents are trying to tell us something, right? O on their way to work, on their way to school, like on their way with, with their shopping. Like everything our residents do is trying to tell us something. And so that's the, the, the challenge that we, all give, we always give our team is, like, I need you to tap into not just what people, at some point, what people said at 5.30 on a Wednesday is less important. Because let me tell you, the enormous, in, amazing, beautiful plans I've seen die because seven people said something into the microphone at, at 5.30 on a Wednesday and pretended they spoke for a community. Right? Look, I'm telling secrets right now. I don't like when people say, the community this. And I'm like, the community? Like, at what meeting did the community decide this? Or are you just saying you talked to like four people at a coffee shop yesterday, right? And, and, and this is something I get really passionate about because we, we, we have a neighborhood in St. Paul right now, Hamlin Midway, it has an old library. The library is 100 years old, it's inaccessible, the bathrooms are downstairs, the building is you know, terrible from the perspective. Of, it, it, there, there's a group of maybe 15 to 20 people who want to convince us that this neighborhood does not want, like the community, right, does not want a brand new state-of-the-art multi-million dollar public library. And if that's true, it's probably the first in the history of the planet <laughs> neighborhood that does not, just does not want a brand new state-of-the-art multi-million dollar public library for the kids to play at, right? But, but 12 people have a megaphone and they can be super loud. And so all I have to say is, my task for my team is always like find the places where people are voting with our feet. And that's what's led us to like some of the things I'm most proud of is things like uh, find free libraries. We don't do late fines in our public libraries anymore. Uh, we don't charge people for swim, for swim lessons. Well, council member, we haven't even got this report to you guys. We just, this is the first year of that policy. 70% um, of the kids who came to swim lessons, our free swim lessons this year, did not know how to swim and never had a swim lesson before in their life. 80% of the kids who came to swim lessons this year, their parents don't know how to swim, right? And so, like identifying those lanes, eliminating um, uh, uh, participation fees for school for uh, youth sports, things like that. The, the, to me, the coolest things that our administration is doing is not because somebody said something in the microphone at a public hearing, but it's because we heard something that people weren't saying in the we'll microphone. Grab you for a second, because I know we've got at least time for maybe two more questions. Okay. I'm looking here. Okay, well, and if not, I'm going to ask this ultimate question. Yeah, the ultimate, the ultimate question. When you think about sustainability of this work and the ingenuity that's happening here and the potential for St. Paul to educate, inform, and inspire other cities, other leaders, the financial sector, and maybe some folks in philanthropy who, frankly, can take a bigger risk. What would you tell them? What would you tell them? I mean, you've been telling us for a long time, but now that I'm three years in, I think I know a little bit more about how do you leverage the organization that I'm in. Mm -hmm. 
and I really want to walk away with a charge for living cities, a charge for this field, and it's grounded in what I know is happening in this room and grounded in what you just shared this afternoon, both on the policy side, the practice side, the human side, and the value side. So I'm curious what you would tell us that we need to do better going forward. What's our challenge and call to action? That's a good question. You know, um, I'm really proud. Of, if you can't tell, I'm really proud and fired up about, about the, the things that we're doing in St. Paul, about some of the policies and some of the initiatives that we've put in place, um, largely many of the things in particular that we're doing through our Office of Financial Empowerment. I tell people every day that even more proud, even, even more than I'm proud of the what, I'm proud of the how. The, the, the secret sauce is really the how. Um, because when we do stuff, sometimes people are like, how, how, what are you going to do to make sure you know, some future mayor and city council can't you know, undo this? And the answer is nothing. Like, I can't do anything to make sure like, to keep a future. Like, if the next mayor will have all the same powers that I had. Like, what are you talking about? The only way to make this stuff sustainable over time is to ensure that there's a community demand for it. Literally, the only way. And so this like, concept of like really engaging, and I spend a lot of time telling people this, like whether it's a bank, your foundation, your organization, your business, your government, whatever it is, when you say we need to do better by whoever those people are, right? Uh, we, we, we think we can be more impactful among young people. We think we can be more impactful among people of color and indigenous Americans. What, what, whoever the uh, teenage, whoever the uh, people who've experienced homelessness, whoever the population is that you decide, that you that you want to serve. My guess is if you're in this room, it's because you're like desperate. Like you're you're the ones who are up at you know eleven o'clock. Uh, your, your your spouse is going to sleep, and you're sitting there looking on your phone, trying to figure out like what are new ways, or thinking through kind of what are new. Am, am I right? I don't know anything about that. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and my 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 task for you is stop. Like free yourself from that. Right. My task for you is like I I, I what, what I'd love to see us all do is stop trying to figure out new ways to help those people. You see where I'm going? Those people. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I know it's hard. Like, like we want to help those people. Stop trying to figure out how we can help them. Because we can't help them if we're stuck with a wall between we and them. A cognitive wall there. And so my question is, like, whoever they are, are they on our board? Whoever they are, are they involved in our decision-making processes? Whoever they are, until they are included in wh who we mean when we say we, we're going to be, like, super limited. Right. I think that's my biggest challenge. And, and that, to me, is my biggest challenge on, in terms of, like, how we sustain the work that we're doing, uh, how we uh, change the risk uh, calculus. I was talking about the risk, cal the, the risk calculus. You know, when people say, like, public safety. Uh, you know, our, you, you know you're doing alternatives and opt optimal responses, and you know this public safety policy versus right. politics right. That I was talking about. And I got mad one day because someone was like, you know, all right, you know, you're, you're changing things, and that's that's risky. And it's like, look, I'm honest, God, my my nephew got robbed at gunpoint a couple years ago in St. Paul, like in an, on the on the block I grew up in. And when they say like that's risky to change our approaches to public safety, wh what you're saying is that. Me getting as many votes next year as I did three years ago should be more important to me than making sure my nephew never gets robbed. Like my, my sister spent a year driving around the block so my nephew could have the courage to walk his dog on his own block. Like, and it, like it kills me to even say that out loud. It's not worth it to have this job if we're not gonna do everything that we can to make sure none of those young people kind of experience that. And so here's the final thing I wanna say to you, and I, I promise you I'll get out of your way because I know you have a lot to do is this. All the stuff that I'm proud of stuff that we've done as a city, all the stuff I'm proud of stuff that I've done in my career um, are things that at one point in time I thought felt impossible. Um, and that was the like most dangerous moment for them. Like that was the most perilous moment for uh, college savings accounts, uh, for guaranteed income, for the St. Paul Prom, all, all the stuff I'm bragging on like the most like shaky ground that's ever stood on was not a public hearing, was not a city council vote, was not you know some conservative tweet monster, you know what I mean? It was like me in my mind ready to destroy this and send it to the trash can of impossibility. 
And my, my, so my, my, my second biggest challenge to you is to make them a part of us. My biggest challenge for you is, my guess is everybody in this room has something in that back drawer, something in your back pocket, your bottom drawer, on your desk somewhere that you know would be amazing, but you also know would be impossible. I'm gonna give you a second to just gather which one that is. Like, you, like we've already tried running the world without that idea. Give us a chance to try running the world with it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank your mayor.